This is Jadecast, your gateway to traditional martial arts and Chinese culture. Brought to you by your host, Shuffle Jonathan Bluestein. Hello and welcome back to Jadecast. I'm so happy to have you here again. Today I have a subject that's real. I swear it's not clickbait. I'm really going to talk about communism and Tai Chi. But before I get to that, let's have a word from our sponsors. Jadecast is brought to you by our sponsors, vitamin D, C and zinc. They are free. You can get vitamin D from sunlight, you fools. You can also get them cheaply from food, from cheap supplements. And if you get that vitamin D, make sure it's with vitamin K2. And if it's vitamin C, liposomal vitamin C is best. You get those vitamin D, C and the zinc, you're not likely to get that COVID-19. How do we know it's true? Because it's not on the mainstream media. Huh. Vitamin D, C and zinc. All right, before we get to Tai Chi and communism, I just want to make a note here that the art of Tai Chi ought to be pronounced as Tai Chi. Tai Chi is the correct Mandarin Chinese pronunciation. Unfortunately, in the West, uh, oftentimes Tai Chi is what we're stuck with. Uh, The full name is Tai Chi Chuan, and I wouldn't get into the meaning of the name in this particular lecture. Now, how is Tai Chi Chuan related to communism? Well, for starters, as you know, China has been governed by the Communist Party since, I think, 1949. Uh, And therefore, uh, for the past few decades, the art of Tai Chi Chuan, which is a traditional Chinese martial art, has been under the influence of uh, that sovereign so-called communist state. It's not exactly the communism of Karl Marx. It's kind of a a mishmash between communism and capitalism and and all sorts of other things. But again, we won't get into that. What is important here that um, the Communist Party specifically, not communism as as an ideology, had a very important and uh, controversial impact on the development of Tai Chi Chuan in modern times. Now, Before getting into that history, I just want to uh, make a comment here and mention this article right here before me, which prompted me to record this lecture for you today. So I saw this a very short, it's it's not even an article, it's um, a news report. Uh, It was on Facebook and this news report would begin our lecture here and we would also end with it. Because the goal of the lecture is to explain to you what this news report is really about and how we we got to this strange situation. News report reads like this. Many decades after learning the Laojia form from their teacher, Chen Zhaopi, the four masters, Chen Xiaowang, Chen Zhenglei, Wang Xian, and Zhu Tiancai, were requested by the Wen County Sports and Culture officials to meet and discuss and, as far as possible, restore the old frame to the original traditional form as taught by Chen Chaopi. This is for the purpose of promoting unity as there are many claims, misinterpretations and variations today. The four senior masters are tasked to carry on transmitting the tradition and method of Chen family Tai Chi Chuan to the next generation of practitioners. Okay, so this is a very convoluted, biased, and fake newsy news report uh, straight from the mouth of the Communist Party. And I want to break it down for you to be able to understand what is actually going on here because this is really the core of what we're talking about the influence of communism or more accurately the communist party over the development of tai chi chuan okay so first um what this in in english everyday speech what is this news report actually telling us 
it is trying to tell us that there are those four masters that have met in their uh, village of birth where they, where they grew up. These four masters are Chen Xiaowang, Chen Jinglei, Wang Xi'an, and Zhu Tianzai. You don't have to remember those names. Uh, they're collectively often referred to as the four tigers of Chen village. And they go and they meet in Chen village. And they are, quote unquote, requested by the Wen County Sports and Culture Officials, which is just a name for people from the Chinese Communist Party who didn't actually make a request of them, they made a demand of them to meet and go get into discussing uh, what is called Lao Jia Ilu. Lao Jia Ilu is one of the two empty handed long forms in Chen style Tai Chi Chuan. And those Communist Party officials want those four masters of Tai Chi Chuan to meet and recreate that form in their style which is not a communist martial art, right? It's a traditional Chinese martial art has nothing to do with communism. And they want them to, quote unquote, recreate the form as it was once practiced by their teacher, Chen Zhaopi, who was really their teacher in, at Chen Village. Okay, wh what is going on here? Why are those people doing this? Why, why are they being, being coerced by the Chinese Communist Party to meet together and create what is called a form by committee. What the hell is going on? What is this about? Okay, so first of all, as you may have noticed, there's a lot of Chen 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 going on, right? There's Chen Village, Chen Style Tai Chi Chuan. There's Chen Xiaowang, Chen Jinglei, the two of the uh, four tigers, the four masters uh, meeting. And their teacher was Chen Zhaopi. He's also Chen. So what's the Chen? Well, Chen is a family name. It's a very common surname in China, and it is the most common surname in Chen Village. Chen Village is thought by perhaps the majority of practitioners of Tai Chi Chuan to have been the original style of Tai Chi Chuan. Uh, to put more simply, uh, the style from which other Tai Chi Chuan styles developed over the years. Now, in China, typically, uh, they recognize so-called five major styles of Tai Chi Chuan. There's Chen style, there's Yang style, and there is Wu style, there is the Wu style developed by the Hao family called Wu Hao style, and there is Sun style, which was developed by Sun Lutang. So Chen style, five styles, right? Chen style, Yang style, Wu style, Wu Hao style, and Sun style. All right, but these are actually not the only styles of Tai Chi Chuan prevalent in China. There are many, many sub-styles, and among them we can also count uh, Zhao Bao Village uh, style of Tai Chi Chuan. Uh, Zhao Bao Village uh, Tai Chi Chuan is very similar to, to Chen style, at least externally. And we also have Li style Tai Chi Chuan. Li uh, style Tai Chi Chuan was created by uh, Li Roidong, famous master from the 20th century uh, and all sorts of uh, other substyles to actually too many to count um, and w what's the deal here we have to look back to the history that the communist party has with Tai Chi Chuan well in the very beginning when the communists took over China they were completely disinterested in the martial arts. Now, a lot of people like to mention the fact that there was persecution of martial artists by the communists. And it is true. It, it, it did happen. But the truth is that the vast majority, over 99% of martial artists, were never persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party. Almost all of the martial artists who were persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party were persecuted like that, usually not because they were martial artists, but because they belonged to the, op to the political opposition, or they were mistaken to be the enemies of the Chinese Communist Party or the, the Chinese state. So the martial arts were usually not the reason for people getting persecuted, all right? It just so happens that because there are so many martial artists in China, that some of them were persecuted. 
Now it did it did happen once in a while that uh, some officials in the Communist Party did not like the fact that that people were teaching uh, skills that allow to allow you to injure or maim others. They saw it uh, as a threat uh, because the authoritarian Chinese, uh, sorry, the authoritarian uh, communist regime did not like the idea of you know people have this knowledge of how to use violence they want complete control over their country right it's typical of authoritarian regimes uh, but again this was very seldom the reason martial artists were persecuted all right so there was a sort of ambivalence on the one hand the chinese communist party had this agenda they they came forth and said that they want to do away with old culture and they did endeavor to destroy a lot of facets of uh, old and ancient Chinese culture, uh, which they did not, fortunately, they did not succeed in. They, uh, most of old and traditional Chinese culture did manage to survive the communist onslaught in the first few decades of the communist rule. Then later, the communists mostly changed their mind. Now they're trying to bring back a lot of Chinese traditional culture, even traditional Chinese martial arts to an extent. But it's also true that traditional Chinese martial arts were old and ancient traditional Chinese culture. And because of that, uh, there was an issue with presenting those martial arts in public. Again, people typically weren't persecuted for practicing or teaching at home or away from the public eye. But in some areas, in some places, especially the big cities, some people were, were not allowed to may maybe teach publicly or make it known that they are teachers of traditional martial arts or show combative techniques, etc., etc. Uh, this is why it was more difficult to teach traditional Chinese martial arts back in the day. Also, we have another phenomenon of a lot of uh, traditional Chinese martial arts teachers um, escaping the communists and uh, moving to, to Hong Kong, to Taiwan, uh, even to Japan, the United States etc. It's, it's a long uh, historical discussion that I wouldn't get into. Our, we, we get to the point of this lecture where and when the Chinese Communist Party is desperately looking for ways to benefit the public's health. Now, of course, a lot of these communist bureaucrats and the communist leadership in China, they weren't really all interested in the health of the public they were sort of they'd sort of gotten to that point that they had to find some solutions because they have just killed way too many people some of them they've killed intentionally but actually the majority of the many millions that were killed in china during the first few decades of the communist rule weren't killed intentionally they're just killed by bad government that had caused plagues and famine and natural disasters and all sorts of terrible things again bringing forth the death of millions and now the chinese government was trying to for for once being be practical they they had committees and they had think tanks and they were trying to figure out okay so we don't have enough food we can't just produce that extra food out of thin air our hospital systems are not advanced yet. Um, we're talking about uh, 1950s and, and 1960s, all right? They were really backwards uh, back in that day. Um, what can we do to benefit the public health so less people would die? They just can't, can't have the entire nation perish. And on top of that, you know, with too many sick people, the nation would be crippled. How can you get a strong nation if everybody is sick they, they're unable to work or they're less productive and they have to take care of sick family members etc so they looked at you know the uh the toolbox that they had the cultural and social toolbox and they they found out that actually there are traditional practices in chinese culture that could be utilized to benefit people's health even if they don't have access to medicine, they can't get better food, you, you can't improve the air quality within the next few years or maybe decades. A lot of things cannot be done, but 
people can exercise. And this was one of the few truly brilliant things that the Chinese Communist Party decided to do. They made a decision that they would actively encourage every single person in China to be physically active and to do some type of sport or even at times a martial art. It was quite successful, I must say. If you go to China to this day, especially in the early mornings, everybody's out playing and practicing, doing something physical. You would see in China people in their 60s and 70s and 80s and even 90s that are as fit as uh, fit 30-year-olds in the United States and Europe. You wouldn't believe how well-built and, and agile and strong some of these people are due to decades and decades of physical practice because basically the government encouraged and incentivized them to, to do some form of physical activity every single day of their lives. And they did because they had to save themselves because had they gotten sick, they wouldn't have enough good food and, and access to medicine to, to take care of it. Well, well, a lot of them. So this was quite successful. But here, here's the thing. Um, like I said, the Chinese communist bureaucrats weren't too keen on the idea of traditional martial arts being used combatively. So they took it in all sorts of different directions. Um, by the 1980s, they devel developed modern wushu, which is uh, a competitive form of traditional Chinese martial arts. It's not traditional anymore. It's basically uh, you stand in a hall and you perform a set of movements in front of judges and you're scored based on different parameters. And modern wushu ten tends to be uh, more in line with calisthenics and dance than it is with traditional martial arts. But most of the movements are borrowed from traditional Chinese martial arts. But this is a later development in the, in the 1980s, late 70s, early 1980s. Also, they developed uh, competitive sports fighting, similar to Muay Thai, which they call Sanda, popular to this day also. But th this, again, uh, becomes more common in the 1980s. Now, we're back, remember, in the 1950s and 60s. And this hasn't come around yet. So they were trying to figure out how can they take the benefits from traditional Chinese martial arts or Qigong. Now, they won't, wouldn't get into Qigong in this lecture. And bring it to the people. And here's what they decided to do in a very communist fashion. They took a bunch of uh, masters of Taiji training, primarily of young style Taiji. They put them together in a committee. And they basically, they, they requested of them. But like I said, it's not a really a request. It's coercion when the Chinese Communist Party asks you to do something. They told them, we need you to create a movement form. In Chinese, we call it Taolu in uh, Japanese Okinawan martial arts, you'd, you'd call it the kata. And that form has to, to have the following parameters. It has to be very simple. So everybody could learn it. Whether they're young children or the elderly, healthy or sick. Whether they've seen Taiji Chuen before or they haven't. It has to not only be simple. It has to be short in length. Meaning it's not going to take you an hour to complete this thing. And thirdly, it has to be easy. So again, everybody could do it. Okay, so that committee sat for a while. I'm not, I'm, I can't recall for how long, maybe weeks, maybe months. And they came up with this taolu or kata a set of movements called the Young 24. Okay, um, the Young 24 form, 24 movement form, is to this day the most commonly practiced movement form of martial arts all over the world. And the reason is that the Chinese Communist Party had taken this Taolu and began to teach it everywhere in China, in schools, 
high schools, kindergartens, colleges, universities, elderly homes, public parks, hospitals. It is everywhere to this day. I do believe at least a third, if not more, of all Chinese people have studied the Young Style 24 movement form. It's that simple to learn and you can learn it anywhere and everywhere and you, you probably would get to learn it sometime during your lifetime if you're a Chinese citizen. Now, what happened was that you got a lot of foreigners starting getting into China in the late 1980s, early 1990s and what's the most commonly taught so-called martial arts form around? It's the Young 24 form. So, of course, a lot of those foreigners study that form and they bring that Taolu to their uh, home countries in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, in the Middle East, and even to Japan and elsewhere, all over the world, really. It used all the way down to, to Australia and New Zealand. And they teach it. Why did they teach it? Because of the same reasons uh, this was created by that committee of young style and, and other uh, styles of masters. Uh, appointed by the Chinese Communist Party because it's easy, it's simple, and it's short, and everybody can learn it. And this is how how traditional, well, it's not traditional anymore, but um, Chinese Tai Chi Chuan has become the so-called world's most popular and most commonly practiced martial art because you literally have hundreds of millions of people who have practiced it. I'm not sure who, how many people actively practice it, but it's probably in the many millions, probably in the dozens of millions. It is really common. And if you have seen Tai Chi Chuan in your life, you've probably seen that form. All right. So this brings us back to those uh, characters, the four tigers of Chen village and to that news report. And now let's get into their particular history. All right, so Chen Village is thought by many to be the birthplace of Tai Chi Chuan, where the original style of Tai Chi Chuan had developed from which the other styles arose over time. Now, this is still being disputed and deliberated, but the version I'm giving you here is the one that currently I personally believe in. Uh, coincidentally, it is also the version endorsed by the Chinese Communist Party. So I'm not sure whether this makes the, narrat the historical narrative more or less believable. You decide. In any case, Chen Village, up until the um, even the late 1990s, it was just a backwards, remote place in, in the Chinese countryside. It's about a three-hour car drive from Shaolin Temple, by the way. Uh, this, this martial art is heavily affected by, by Shaolin martial arts. And the people, they were just poor for many generations. Almost nobody knew the place existed. Uh, it was uh, obviously also the residence of the Chen clan and a, a very extended family called Chen as well as uh, other families who intermarried into their clan. And they had a big problem with their Tai Chi Chuan. Uh, it has been handed down for many generations. Some say we're currently at the 20th, 21st, 22nd generation. That is also disputed, but probably it has been there for over 12 generations, which is a long period of time could be uh, as old as uh, slightly over 400 years. And the problem they had was that the art and the tradition of Chen style Tai Chi was dying in the village. And the problem was that by the early 20th century, the old masters in the village were dying or some of them have left over the years and the generations. And the young people did not want to study their family art because they're, they're really struggling. They're poor. They didn't have enough to eat. And they were be just busy with survival. And 
although this is a very effective martial art and it's good for health and it does have a lot of weaponry practice overall you know um things times have changed um the country was in chaos and unlike in the past when you protected the village with melee weapons and with your empty hands now people were appealing to firearms to save them and even if they did not have firearms themselves still um their swords and halberds and and spears wouldn't save them from an army or a militia that would come over to their village with firearms that's going to be a problem so they they were discouraged from keeping on with the family tradition and it got to the point uh, when in i think it was in the 19 late 1960s or 1970s um chen jiao chen jiao pi or some call him chen jiao pei it's two different names for the same person he came back to Chen village uh, in his older years. He was already, I think, around his 70s to try to teach the young generation their family's art so it wouldn't get lost. Now, in reality, it wouldn't have gotten lost anyway because they, there were a few practitioners here and there in other places in China who kept the tradition alive. There was there's even some lineages say in Korea of Chen style Taiji and elsewhere, but the, it was very important for them to preserve the tradition of the family and of the clan, right? So Chen Zhaopi came back to the village and he took up those four young folk who were teenagers, right? And these were Chen Xiaowang, Chen Zhenglei, Wang Xian, and Zhu Tiancai, and these people. They weren't by themselves, but they were the ones who persisted in their studies. Now, the problem was that Chen Zhaopi taught them when they were young teenagers. I can't recall the exact ages, but I think it was, what, like 12 to 15 or something like that. Or maybe it was 11 to 16, right around those ages. And you, you can teach people quite a lot, but their level of understanding, comprehension and skill cannot become truly great while they're at that age, right? You can at best lay some foundations. Now, the challenge was made worse by the fact that, again, Chen Zhaopi was older. And he was older in the time, you know, he was living in Chen village, he didn't have access to uh, high quality water, they didn't have a lot of food. Um, and making things even worse, not only that he was living in harsh conditions and he was old, in the midst of it all, while he was teaching those four youngsters who were later become, they, they would have this collective name of the four tigers of Chen village, uh, a group of Chinese communist bullies came into the village and persecuted uh, Chen Zhaopi because of his political affiliations. This was a very sad and unfortunate and, and just vicious state of affairs and they, they took this um old man and they beat him up now of course he couldn't resist even even if he physically was up to it to fight some people you know not only was older and facing a group of young younger people they had weapons and any anyone who resisted they would kill him sometimes they would kill family members he was unable to do anything. He was taken somewhere public in the village. He was humiliated in front of everybody. Can't remember exactly what they did to him, but at the time it was common to undress people and beat them up, to put humiliating signs on them, etc., etc. And this particular experience shook him so much that poor Chen Zhaopi uh, tried to kill himself. And shortly thereafter, he threw himself into a well. Whew. Well, that's, that's quite a, a series of events that we wouldn't wish upon anyone, wouldn't we? And, I mean, fortunately, or unfortunately for him, depending on how you see it, he survived um, his attempt to kill himself. And he survived and on, he only broke his leg. Only, I mean, so they brought him out of the well. And, and he was older. He, he underwent this 
terrible, terrible physical and, and emotional trauma, du the double physical trauma. And he was supposed to teach those youngsters. Well, naturally, uh, he wasn't able to carry that task to completion. And unfortunately, within a few short years, he passes away. All right, so um, those four teenagers did not get the complete transmission of the art, but they got something. They got some foundations, which is good. Later on, uh, Chen Zhaokui, Chen Zhaokui, the son of Chen Fake. Uh, Chen Fake was a very famous teacher of Chen style Tai Chi Chuan who taught in Beijing. Uh, Chen Fake came and, and taught the guys for, I think it was three weeks. And later, uh, they studied some more with Feng Zhiqiang. Feng Zhiqiang, Gong Fu brother of Chen Fake. Uh, sorry, Feng Zhiqiang, Gong Fu brother of Chen Zhaokui, and also a disciple of Chen Fake. Chen Fake, Chen Zhaokui's father, taught Feng, Feng Zhiqiang, and then Feng Zhiqiang came to Chen village, and he taught Chen Xiaowang, Chen Jinglei, Wang Xian, and Zhu Tiancai. Uh, for, I'm, I'm not sure how long, but he helped them also uh, reconstruct some of their family's tradition. Okay, and uh, over time, uh, those four people, Chen Xiaowang, Chen Jinglei, Wang Xian, Zhu Tiancai, the four tigers of Chen village, they grew up, uh, they taught many, many thousands of people. They became famous uh, due to all sorts of politics. They, they gained the support of the Chinese Communist Party. Chen Village became a tourist attraction equivalent to Shaolin. Uh, they got a lot of Western students. Some of them got even rich teaching Chen style Tai Chi Chuan. And the rest is history. Uh, but then this gets us to that news report that I began the lecture with and now we are able to better understand what this was really about. Often when the Chinese Communist Party becomes your business partner, the benefits could be that you potentially would become rich as has happened to some of those teachers and in their case also they had gotten a lot of students, as many students as they wanted. Chen Village became this big thing with huge schools. They all built themselves uh, new houses, giant facilities, a really um, impressive, going to be a very impressive looking place over time. The downside of being a business partner or working with the Chinese Communist Party is that you have to do exactly what they tell you. And um, but here's, here's what ha what's going on right now. So in Chen style Tai Chi Chuan, there are two Taolu or Kata, uh, move, two movement forms that uh, are the foundation of the empty handed training. One is called Ilu and the other Arlu. Ilu and Arlu meaning first road and second road. And I won't get into the specifics of, you know, how these are practiced, their characteristics and, and everything that's, um, for another lecture and probably a few interviews I'll do with uh, Chen style masters in the future. Now, here, here comes along the Chinese Communist Party and in a typical fashion, they want to standardize. They want Tai Chi Chuan by committee. They want to create a form of Tai Chi Chuan which is communist Tai Chi Chuan, quote unquote. It's not really communist, it's just communist party Tai Chi Chuan. It's, it sounds funny, it sounds weird, like they, they have this bureaucracy has really nothing to do with Tai Chi Chuan. But here's the thing, it's, it's the sort of thing they do, uh, i give you a, a, an even more outrageous example. Um, it was recently, in recent years, that the number of Christians in China was steadily growing. And... Throughout the, the ages, the Chinese imperial dynasties, they, they were always weary of a religion's gaining power. Because it happened often that when a religion became too powerful, it would serve as a basis to uh, start a rebellion. And a lot of these rebellions uh, ended up killing millions or dozens of millions and sometimes overthrowing those imperial dynasties. That's a lot of headache that the Chinese Communist Party would like to avoid. So... Typically, there are two solutions for handling that sort of situation in China over the past few thousand years. One solution was to just uh, kill or threaten to kill everybody involved with that religion, which is a less resort. They, they don't start with that usually. 
what they prefer doing, and it's a very, very Chinese thing to do, is to make a standardized so-called state version of whatever threatens them. So I remember a few years ago, I saw a report by on, the, uh, on one of the Chinese Communist Party news channels. They're talking about how Christianity is so wonderful. And it is so, so wonderful. The Chinese Communist Party is in the process of creating a version of the Bible that suits communist values, <laughs> which is quite ridiculous. Now, of course, anyone who comes from uh, a Jewish or a Christian or a Muslim tradition would recognize how absurd and ridiculous is the notion of trying to make a state-certified version of the Old or New Testaments, and especially a communist version. <laughs> that just makes no sense whatsoever. It's just, you can't, th these are texts that are part religion, part philosophy, part historical narrative. You can just take that and, and make it like a government communist version of it. That's utterly absurd. People, anywhere in the Western world, people would just laugh at this. Anyone proposing this would be a laughing stock, even though such things had happened, right? Because <laughs> as we know, in Europe, uh, a few monarchs have done this. They have created versions of the Old Testament and the New Testament to suit their beliefs, but not to the extent that the Chinese Communist Party plans to do. Okay, they're going to go way, way far with this. And remember, they, they also have terrible translations to begin with because, well, I won't get into that, but they have terrible translations. So anyhow, in the same manner, what the Chinese Communist Party bureaucrats basically did, and this, this is what the, this news uh, report was really about, they went to those four tigers of Chen village, Qin Chiao Wang, Chen Zhenglei, Wang Xi'an, and Zhu Tiantai. And they told them, look, we want you to sit together as a committee, which is already ridiculous because these, these four masters, each of them has his own interpretation and version of Chen style Tai Chi because they've each been practicing. I mean, they've been meeting and practicing together, but they've, they've practiced separately for decades. So they have their own interpretations, but they want them to sit as a committee because they're famous and, and they're the, what some of the um, known authorities on, on this type of martial art nowadays in their generation. And as a committee, recreate a so-called standard version of the Ilu, the first road, one of the two uh, primary um, empty-handed movement forms in the style, a standardized version of Ilu uh, to match the aspirations of the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, they don't say that. They say it, it should be the old-style version, the version that was really taught by Chen Zhaopi or Chen Zhaopei before you guys changed it. Because the Chinese Communist Party is sly in this manner. Uh, they appeal to what Chinese like. And Chinese like old school things. They wouldn't say it's the communist version. They say it's the version practiced by the ancestors. So that brings us full circle, basically. Uh, what is going on right now in our time, as you are listening to this, there are these four masters of Chen style Tai Chi, or being coerced by the Chinese Communist Party to sit together and make a standardized ver version um, of their style to teach to everyone that is supposed to appeal to the masses in the same manner that the Chinese Communist Party led to the creation of the Young Style 24 movement form. Now we got to ask, is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's, some, it's complex, folks. Um, it depends on how you look at it. Well, of course, when uh, an authoritarian government comes and interferes with a naturally developing social tradition, that's a bad thing. We, we don't like that to happen, right? They really shouldn't. But this is communist China, so who are we kidding? They're going to meddle with anything they want. Um, well, let's look at what happened with the Young 24 movement form. Uh, on one hand, they created this artificial thing 
that really, I mean, for traditional martial artists who have, have practiced traditional Tai Chi Chuen or similar martial arts, they see this, this thing and they kind of cringe because, uh, yeah, it's like, make, like, it's as if you took five different cars, you broke, broke away parts from each of them and you just crudely put them together so anyone could drive the thing but this makes for quite an ugly car and, and it's not wasn't really what was intended by any of the five original cars and it's not gonna drive so well it's certainly not gonna drive as well as any of the the other five cars it was made from it's not gonna be as efficient it's not gonna be as effective it's gonna have innate faults it's gonna break down People are going to misunderstand what it is. Especially, imagine people see this car and they haven't seen the original five and they're told, this is the original model. Oh my God. So, um, yeah, that, that's not... You know what that reminds me of? Has any of you seen that? Uh, I like the Alien films. Have you seen the fourth one in the series, Alien Resurrection? Uh, that's the terrible, terrible scene when Ripley... Um, Ripley and the crew get into that room full of unsuccessful clones. This is sort of what the Young 24 form is, unfortunately. Or <laughs> well, if you know what, what I'm talking about, you would cringe. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Um, and and if, if you don't, don't go watch Alien Resurrection if you haven't seen the previous movies prior. It, the, the whole movie doesn't make sense. And it's also not the best of them. Anyhow, going back on point. <laughs> um... That, so on one hand, we have this ugly creature. On the other hand, uh, this ugly creature is responsible for the spread of Tai Chi Chuen across the world. Now, because of that form by committee, uh, committee of people coerced by the Chinese Communist Party, Tai Chi Chuen, or many know it as Tai Chi, is in almost every single country, maybe all, all countries all over the world now. It's extremely popular. And, and, you know, some people start with that crude thing and at one point or another, they get to practice something a little, bo a little more advanced, a little more sophisticated, a little more traditional. Now, also, I mean, is it really that bad? Well, I mean, what, what are we going to do with those young children or the elderly or the sick? Um, certainly the traditional forms are too much for them. Maybe they do need something like this. Maybe it's better to get some movement that's overall not bad, overall it is healthy, than no movement at all. So it's far from being perfect, but it is something. However, we are currently in the process of creation of the new standardized chin style ilu form and we are we have yet to find out how it looks and how it is going to uh, serve or be of this service to that style and that martial art and only time will tell only time will tell well that's it for today folks did you enjoy this lecture if so first of all tap that subscribe button come on folks there's lots more great content coming now, if you would like to learn more about traditional martial arts, then I've written a number of books about them and you might want to have a look. So you go on your favorite Amazon website, go on the search box and you can type my name, Jonathan Bluestein, you'd find my books. Or you can write the names of some of my books like Research of Martial Arts or The Martial Arts Teacher. You'd get to these. And if you'd like to learn more about what I do and teach, you're most welcome to visit the website of our International Martial Arts Organization. This website is found at bluejadesociety.com. Blue like the color blue, jade like the gemstone jade, society like a society.com. Bluejadesociety.com. See you around next time.